Well, good morning again. Welcome to Calvary Chapel, Quincy, California. Turn with me in your Bibles this morning to the book of James chapter 4. We've been going through the book of James, chapter by chapter and verse by verse. Uh, we're in chapter 4. We're going to be starting in verse uh, 8 and 9 this morning. Actually, in verse 7, we'll be starting this morning. But the theme of the book of James is spiritual maturity. It's all about the practical aspects of Christian living. And, and this book addresses those practical matters uh, such as trials. We all go through trials. In fact, James says when you fall into various trials. He didn't say if you do. He said when you do. You will. If you live long enough, you'll fall into a trial. You'll fall into a difficulty. So it deals with trials. It, it deals with temptations. It deals with how we treat one another. It deals with having a faith that works and is not dead. How we use our tongue. Wisdom, pride, worldliness, judgment, boasting, and even prayer are dealt with in the book of James. The key verse is James chapter 1, verse 4, the second half of that verse, where it says that you may be perfect and complete, lacking nothing. And, and that's a summary not only of the purpose of trials in our life, but that is a summary of the book of James. It's written to, to help us mature in Christ. That's that word perfect. Doesn't mean that you'll ever be a perfect person in this life. There was only one perfect person. That was our Lord Jesus Christ. But it does mean that we are to mature in Christ. We're to grow up in Christ. And that's the purpose of the book of James, to help us do that. Now, chapter 3 ended by comparing the wisdom of this world, the wisdom that is from below, with the wisdom from above that comes from God. This world's wisdom, James said, and listen carefully, said this world's wisdom. And so much of what we see today is this world's wisdom, this world's way of thinking. Well, this world's wisdom is earthly. It only has this world in, in view. It's not looking to the world to come. It's also sensual. That is, it gratifies the flesh. And then lastly, James says, it's demonic. It's inspired by Satan. But God's wisdom, James tells us, the wisdom that is from above is first pure. You see, it's not adulterated by sin it's pure wisdom then peaceable gentle willing to yield full of mercy and good fruits without partiality and without hypocrisy see god's wisdom brings the good stuff to us amen. and we where do we get god's wisdom from the word of god amen and, and what better place to get God's wisdom than the book of Proverbs, right? The book of wisdom. So if you haven't been coming on Wednesday night, I want to put a plug in for Wednesday night. Come on Wednesday. The service is only about an hour long. It's a midweek pick-me-up. We get to worship the Lord, and then we get to hear from the book of Proverbs. So if you haven't come, come out. You will really uh, benefit from that. Now, chapter 4 began describing the results of using this world's wisdom. And, and what we saw last week is it doesn't result in peace. James says it results in wars and fights among you. That's what happens when we try to use this world's wisdom to run God's church. Or even to run our own lives. Wars and fights take place. And last week we looked at the first six verses of chapter 4. And so, so let's read those six verses as we catch up to where we are starting in verse 7 this morning. James says, Where do wars and fights come from among you? Do they not come from your desires for pleasure that war in your members? You lust and do not have. You murder and covet and cannot obtain. You fight and war, yet you do not have because you do not ask. You ask and do not receive 
because you ask amiss that you may spend it on your pleasures. Adulterers and adulteresses, do you not know that friendship with the world is enmity with God? Whoever therefore wants to be a friend of the world makes himself an enemy of God. Or do you think that the scripture says in vain, the spirit who dwells in us yearns jealously, but he, that is God, gives more grace. Therefore, he says, God resists the proud, but gives grace to the humble. So let's pick it up now in chapter 4, starting in verse 7. Therefore, submit to God, resist the devil, and he will flee from you. Therefore, because God resists the proud and gives grace to the humble, we should therefore submit to God. If you want more grace, then submit to God. If you want the good things God has for you, then submit to God. Pride was Satan's sin. That's the reason he fell. And he tempts humanity with it. But pride doesn't get you anywhere with God. In fact, the Bible says right here, God resists the proud. The better way is to be humble, to humble ourselves before God. That is, the better way is to have a right and proper and correct estimation of ourselves before God. To realize who we really are before God. We are sinners in need of a Savior. Amen? Amen. Each and every one of us. The Bible says there is none righteous, no, not one. For all have sinned. What does all mean? All. all. For all have sinned and fallen short of the glory of God. So we need to have a right estimation of ourselves before God. And that begins by submitting ourselves to God. That word submit, by the way, is a military term. And it means to put ourselves in rank order we're the privates in god's army amen? amen he's the general it's a sorry state of the army and when the private starts leading <laughs> we are the servants and he is the master we are the subjects and he is the king amen. so we need to get in line and place ourselves under he is authority. When we do, we can then carry out His commands, His orders. And the next command is to resist the devil, and he will flee from you. Remember back at the end of chapter 3, we just read that. We learned that this world's wisdom is earthly, sensual, and demonic. And it leads to wars and fights among you. You see, Satan uses this world's wisdom and pride. Help me not go into the whole thing about Pride Month, right? <laughs> but you know what? It's not just their problem. Growing up, how many of you remember? I mean, I remember growing up, we were taught to be proud, right? Yeah. Your little league baseball team won. Be proud, boys, right? Your football team won. School spirit, be proud, right? We got pride on, we got pride dripping off of every one of us. I look around at my yard and the stuff I'm done, I'm proud. That's why it's going to all burn up one day. But pride is a universal problem that we all have. And pride gets us all stirred up to fight the wrong battles, he gets us fighting among ourselves. When we do that, then the gospel is neglected. And today, this world's wisdom tells us that right is wrong and wrong is right. It tells us that good is evil and evil is good. And I want you to listen carefully to this. Now, I, I, listen carefully. When this world's wisdom 
conflicts with the wisdom found in God's Word. When this world's wisdom tells you right is wrong and wrong is right, that good is evil and evil is good, that wisdom, that kind of wisdom does not come from above. It's earthly, it's sensual, and it's demonic. So we must stop submitting to and giving into this world's wisdom. It comes from Satan. It, it just flat does. That's what J- I didn't say it. James said it. Amen. Blame him. And we must submit to God and resist the devil and his efforts to indoctrinate us in evil, to make us believe that evil's good, to make us believe that what God said is wrong is actually somehow right. We must resist that and submit ourselves to God and to His wisdom found in His Word. Amen? Amen. And when we do so, when we put ourselves under God's authority and reject Satan's authority and this world's wisdom, then Satan will flee from you. You see, he can't stand before you to deceive you when you place yourself under the authority of God. He's going to go find an easier target. He's going to go find an easier mark. In fact, the word the word resist comes from two Greek words. And the New Testament was written in Greek originally. So it came from two Greek words that mean stand and against. So resist means to stand against. And Satan will flee from you when you stand against him by submitting to God's word. Submitting to the Lord and resisting the devil. You know, a famous ancient Christian writer named Hermas wrote this. He said, the devil can wrestle against the Christian, but he cannot pin him. (laughs) He cannot pin him. So James' point in all of that is that when we humble ourselves before the Lord, submitting to his authority and standing against the devil and his worldly wisdom, It's then that we find the victory. It's then that the devil flees from us. And then the wars and fights that are among us will cease. And they'll cease for two reasons. Number one is that we will all be on the same page with God. And if we're on the same page with God, we will then be on the same page with one another. See how that works? You get on the same page with God and you will conversely be on the same page with one another. And the second is that the instigator of wars and fights will flee from us. All of that begins by humbling ourselves and submitting to God. Now look at verses 8 and 9. Draw near to God. And he will draw near to you. Cleanse your hands, you sinners, and purify your hearts, you double minded. Lament and mourn and weep. Let your laughter be turned to mourning and your joy to gloom. So both submit and resist our commands. James is not suggesting that we submit to God and resist the devil. He's commanding us to do so. And again, don't forget, and I've I've mentioned this on many occasions, God's commands, God's laws are holy guardrails on the road of life. Amen? God's not intending to take the joy out of our life, but that your joy might be full. He's trying to protect us in this life. And so he sets up guardrails. Outside of that guardrail is the cliff, right? You drive your car off the cliff and you will end in destruction. So stay within the guardrails. 
you know, how many of you want to come down Bucks Lake Road right after a huge snowstorm? <laughs> you know, all those little turns. Jim has done it many times in the, the county truck plowing the road. And even he doesn't want to do it. So God's laws, God's commands are holy guardrails for us. And here we find another command, but it's a command attached to a promise. We are commanded to draw near to God, and then we have this wonderful promise attached to it. He will draw near to you. I want you to notice, it doesn't say He might draw near to you. It doesn't say you're wasting your time looking for God. It says definitively, He will draw near to you. It's a guarantee to those who first obey the command to draw near to God, to take the first step. You see, God won't intrude into your life. But if you invite Him in, He will come. Amen? If you invite Him in. The Bible says in Revelation chapter 3, it says, Behold, this is Jesus speaking, Behold, I stand at the door and knock. And if any man will hear my voice and open the door, I will come into him and sup with him and he with me. Isn't that wonderful? All you have to do is take the first step. And God will meet you. He will meet you there. That's His promise. You can write that down. You can highlight that in your Bible. You can count on it. It's true. Too many Christians, however, expect God to show up and be there for them. But they've never taken steps to draw near to God. They've never made the effort. And what does it mean, by the way, to draw near to God? What does that even look like? How does it practically work out? Well, it certainly starts by submitting to God's authority in and over your life. It includes regularly reading God's Word. How do we know about God? We know about God through His Word. It includes regularly fellowshipping with one another like we're doing this morning. I mean, Jim had to herd cats to get you all back to your seat so he could start <laughs> announcements this morning because you're having such a great time fellowshipping one with another. Doesn't hurt that we pump you full of sugar and coffee. <laughs> but nonetheless, right? right? There's that fellowship that goes on. So we, we get into God's Word. We fellowship with one another. We share the communion of this life together. Amen? That's what the word communion means, by the way. It means common. Of course, we share communion. We all have in common our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. And we remember what Christ has done for us once a month as we celebrate communion. But we also have this life in common, this Christian life in common. So we share our life together, in a sense, in that way. And then lastly, regular prayer. Not only individually, but corporately gathering together to pray with one another for the needs of the church, the community, our state, nation, and world. Amen? Amen? That's how we draw near to God. But we must take those steps. If you expect God to draw near to you, but you haven't taken any of those steps, good luck to you. Good luck. He's waiting. He's standing at the door. Will you open the door to Him? Will you? He's knocking. Say yes to Jesus. Amen? Amen? Say yes to Jesus. And here's the most amazing thing about all that. God wants to be near you. God wants to be near you. God wants to hang out with you, to fellowship with you. So if you're not finding Him, it might be that you're not really seriously looking for Him. So start looking for Him. Start following Him. Open your Bible. And if you don't know where to start reading your Bible, open to the Gospel of John. That Gospel was written to increase your faith. Start there. 
Start there. And as we are drawn near to God, we must turn from our sin. It says here, cleanse your hands, you sinners, and purify your hearts, you double-minded. Lament and mourn and weep. Let your laughter be turned to mourning and your joy to gloom. I don't know about you, but whenever I get close to God, I realize what a sinner I am. I realize what a sinner. When I get close to you, you realize what a sinner I am too. <laughs> My wife certainly does. And I don't know about you, but I need a regular holy bath. Amen? Amen? And the Greek word used here for sinners is the word used for the man whose sin is obvious and notorious. It's a word used for hardened sinners. And when we get close to God, we realize what hardened sinners we really are. And so we need to take a bath of repentance. Amen? Amen. Take a bath. It doesn't, doesn't hurt when you begin to pray to first and foremost ask God to forgive you. It says he's faithful and just to forgive you and cleanse you from all unrighteousness. It's there for the asking. All you got to do is ask, and he'll meet you there. And then you're clean, you see. Now, you've been cleansed, right, by the blood of Christ, of all your sins, past, present, and, and future. But as you walk through this life, you get dirty. Even Jesus had to wash the disciples' feet, amen? And so we need to get our feet cleansed every once in a while, amen? Because they get dirty as we walk through this life. So get clean by confessing your sins to the Lord. Now, look at verse 10. Humble yourselves in the sight of the Lord, and He will lift you up. Here's another wonderful promise attached to the obedience of a command. The command is that we humble ourselves before the Lord, in the sight of the Lord. And the promise is that, that He will lift us up. Isn't that a beautiful picture? Yeah, I mean, just picture that in your mind for a moment. If you drop down on your knees before the Lord, submitting to His authority, repenting of your sins, then He will reach out His hand to you and He will lift you up. Isn't that a wonderful, wonderful picture? You fall on your knees before the Lord. You're, you're sorry for your sin. You weep, you cry. And Jesus reaches out His hand and He says, Get up, get up. And He picks you up says he will lift you up. Satan wants to beat you down. But God wants to lift you up. But we must obey the Lord. Amen? Amen. We must obey the Lord for that to be true. Now that we know what to do in order to get right with God, James now tells us how to get right with one another. Look at verse 11. Do not speak evil of one another, brethren. He who speaks evil of a brother and judges his brother speaks evil of the law and judges the law. But if you judge the law, you are not a doer of the law, but a judge. So getting right with God invariably should lead to getting right with one another. The one must follow the other. In fact, Jesus linked these two together when he was asked by the scribe, which is the greatest commandment in the law? He said to love the Lord your God with all your heart, mind, and soul is the first and great commandment. But he didn't stop there. He went on to say, and the second is like it, just like it, just like the, to love the Lord, the second is like it. You shall love your neighbor as yourself. And then he said, on these two commands hang all the law and the prophets. That's a summary of the entire law of God right there. Love God and love one another. That's the summary. It's all about that. If you could do those two things, then you got it. You got it, you see. But when we speak evil of one another, we're not loving our neighbor as ourselves. We're not loving one another. 
let alone loving our brother or sister as ourself. And the idea presented here pictures those, here's the picture of, of those who speak evil of one another according to this text. The picture that the words behind uh, this paints, it paints a picture of those who gather together in small groups in the shadows where nobody else can hear them and they talk about you and they ruin your reputation, you see? That's what this is talking about. That's the kind of speaking evil that's being talking about here. It's the kind of speaking that is designed to hurt other people. So as the old Sunday school song goes, remember this one? I'm going to sing it for you. <laughs> be careful, little mouth, what you say. Oh, be careful, little mouth, what you say. For the Father up above is looking down in love. So be careful, little mouth, what you say. Amen? Amen? Amen. Hey, you know, it's got a whole bunch of... Be careful, little hands, what you do. You know, <laughs> all of that. But that sums it up for us. Even a child, you see, even a child can understand that. Be careful what you say about and to one another. Don't be saying hurtful things about one another. When we speak evil of one another in this way, we're pretending to be God, to know the thoughts and intents of someone else's heart. We set ourselves up as judges. Look at the next verse. Verse 12, there is one lawgiver who is able to save and destroy. Who are you to judge another? God is the lawgiver. There wasn't a single one of us on Mount Sinai giving the law to Moses, was there? There's one lawgiver who is able to save and destroy. And this has to do, by the way, again, with hurtful speech designed to destroy one another. It's not about speech, and I want you to listen carefully to this. It's not about speech that's designed to encourage and even correct one another. There is a difference. When we speak the truth of God's word in correction to a sinner, it's with the goal of restoration, not destruction. So this is not a, a blanket or cover for sinful behavior. It's about speech that is designed to hurt and malign one another. Speech that destroys people. Speech that does not help them. Now you may say, your speech is not helpful in my situation because I should just be left alone to live and let live and love and let love. But if we don't love you enough, to tell you what you are doing is wrong and will send you to hell for all eternity. How many of you know eternity is a long time? If we don't love you enough to warn you, to flee from the wrath to come, then that's not love. That's not love. So when it says here, who are you to judge another? It's talking about judging with the intent to hurt and destroy, not to correct and build up. There is no blanket do not judge in the Bible. In fact, the Old Testament, the prophet was said to be a watchman on the wall. And the watchman's job was to warn the people when danger came. And if he didn't warn them, then their blood was required of the watchman. He was responsible for their death. But if he did warn them, then their blood was upon their own shoulders, you see, upon their own heads. So we should be watchmen on the wall, amen, in our society at times. And that's an unpopular place to be today, isn't it? Mm -hmm. To be a watchman on the wall, to tell this society that what they're doing is going to lead to destruction, personally, individually, and society-wide. Yep. But there are times and places where we must stand we must speak. 
because eternity is at stake. Eternity is at stake. And that's not the kind of judging that's spoken about here. What's spoken about here is that that judging, that judgmental attitude, judging the intents and motives of people's hearts, and then speaking about it with others. Next, James deals with the issue of those who live their lives independent of God and His will. Look with me now at verses 13 and 14. Come now, you who say, today or tomorrow, we will go to such and such a city, spend a year there, buy and sell and make a profit. Whereas you do not know what will happen tomorrow. For what is your life? It is even a vapor that appears for a little time and then vanishes away. What I want you to notice first is the will of man versus the will of God. These make their plans without consulting God. They're not concerned with the will of God. In fact, look what they say. We will go. See that? We will go to such and such a city. Spend a year there. Buy and sell. Make a profit. Nowhere in all of that planning is God mentioned. Nowhere are they submitted to God and His will. It's all about their own will and their own glory, their own profits, not about God's will and God's glory. Do you see the difference? Mm -hmm. And God is not against, by the way, God is not against good planning. God is not against planning for the future. One of my favorite verses is out of the book of Proverbs. The prudent man foreseeth the evil and hideth himself, but the simple pass on and are punished. So God's not against good planning. He's against planning without Him. You see? He's against planning without Him. The great English preacher, Charles Haddon Spurgeon, said this. He said, There are two great certainties about things that shall come to pass. One is that God knows. The other is that we do not. So since God knows the future, doesn't it make sense to submit your plans Mm -hmm. to Him? Doesn't it? Of course it does. It's the only thing that makes sense in this regard. So submit yourself to God's will, to God's plan. And how do you know, by the way, that you are in or out of the will of God? Many, many Christians want to know this. In fact, I think when I first got saved 46 years ago, the first book I bought was How to Know God's Will. I wanted to know. What do you want me to do, Lord? How do I know your will? Well, I'm going to give you one simple concept to know God's will. If you are striving to make it happen in your own strength and by your own will, you're likely out of the will of God. But conversely, if the peace of God is ruling in your heart and mind and you're submitted to God's will, you're likely in the will of God. It's really as simple as that. In fact, we read this in Colossians 3.15. It says, And let the peace of God rule in your hearts, to which you are also called in one body, and be thankful. So that's the simple test. The test to know, are you in the will of God or out of the will of God? Do you have the peace of God, or are you striving in your own strength? James goes on to speak about the brevity of life, how short it is compared with eternity. He said, whereas you do not know what will happen tomorrow. For what is your life? It is even a vapor that appears for a little time and then vanishes away. Jesus told the story in the Gospel of Luke about a a rich man 
who had a bumper crop one year. And he said to himself, he said, Self, you got all the... I'm paraphrasing here for you. <laughs> he said, Self, you've got all this food, all this crop. So he tore down his barns and he built bigger barns. And then he sat back on his proverbial couch and he said, I've got food laid up for many years. I can take my rest, take my ease. And then God said to him, Tonight, your life will be required of you. His life, he did all that work, all that planning, all that effort without consulting God. God might have told him, hey, don't, don't bother, dude. You're going to have a heart attack at the end of the year. Okay? It's a waste of time. <laughs> Maybe. Again, I'm paraphrasing here. But you see... He didn't make his plans by consulting God. He ran off on his own, boasted of his own good position in this life. Don't be like that man. Don't be like that man. Submit yourself, submit your plans to God. And, and you know what? I'm just as guilty of this as you are. I'm always running off doing something. I always got a plan. Ask my wife. I've got plan A, B, and C. I mean, always I got stuff. Just like you, I got to stop. And I got to submit to the Lord. Amen. And I got to bring my plans to the Lord. And so do you. Next, James shows us how to plan for the future properly and biblically. Look with me at verses 15 and 16. Instead, you ought to say, if the Lord wills, we shall live and do this or that. But now you boast in your arrogance. All such boasting is evil. So godly, biblical planning means taking our plans to the Lord first. Submitting our plans before the master planner. You know, when they build great high-rise buildings, there are many, many architects and sub-architects and contractors on a project of that magnitude. But at some point, all of those plans, all of those drawings must be submitted to the chief architect, the chief builder on the project. Amen? The same is true for us. We may draw up our plans. I know I do. But we'd better take them to the boss for approval first. Amen? Amen. Otherwise, it's pride to think that we can operate without the Lord. James puts it this way. He says, but now you boast in your arrogance. Look what I've done. You know? Look what I've accomplished. All such boasting is evil. So take the time. Take the time, saints, to go to the Lord with your plans. When I first began dating Diane, I went to the Lord in prayer. <laughs> Can you imagine that? Fall on my, ah, Lord, help! No. <laughs> it wasn't quite like that. <laughs> but I, I took it to the Lord in prayer and I asked the Lord about it. I asked the Lord about it. Lord, is this the one you have for me? Or should I look for another? <laughs> But I've got to tell you, I had this, this was my experience as I prayed about that, as I submitted my plans to the Lord. This was my experience. And I, I had it one time and never had it another time in my life. But I sensed in the spirit the Lord smiling. I sensed the Lord smiling. So I pursued her. We got married and we've been married. This year will be 39 years. And I've never regretted it. She's an angel. She is. <laughs> to, to put up with me, she is. That's for sure. She didn't get the good end of that bargain. I'll, I'll tell you that. <laughs> but we submit our plans to the Lord. All of our plans. Amen? Amen. Therefore, verse 17. Therefore, because of all that, therefore, to him who knows to do good, and does not do it to him it is sin. So now you know some stuff, right? 
Now you're responsible for the stuff you know. You know that pride promotes strife. You know that God resists the proud and gives grace to the humble. You know you're supposed to submit to God and resist the devil. You know you're not supposed to speak evil of one another. And you know you're supposed to submit your plans to God. Now that you know this stuff, you're responsible to that stuff. If you fail to obey it, if you fail to be doers of the word, it is sin to you. So obey the word of God and you will be blessed. Ignore the word of God and you will not be blessed. The Bible says in the book of Galatians, it says that God is not mocked. Whatever, whatsoever a man sows, that shall he also reap. So sow good things in your life by knowing and obeying the word of God. You will never, ever regret it. And as we close today, I want to once again encourage you to encourage you with what James said in chapter 1, verse 22. He said, but be doers of the word. And you've heard the word this morning, right? But be doers of the word and not hearers only, deceiving yourselves. Over the last several weeks, we've heard many things in this study of God's word. And I hope those things will not be lost on any one of us, including myself. We all need to hear these things and we all need to do these things. Amen? Amen? Amen. Well, let's pray. We're going to have the worship team come back up for one final song. Heavenly Father, what a powerful message from your word you have given us by way of the Holy Spirit. We so thank you for these things and we pray that you will write these things on the tablets of our hearts, that we might not forget them, that they might be there for us, that we might be able to apply them to our lives and thus live in obedience to you and live in your blessing. And so, Lord, we thank you and praise you for what you've done here this morning. We do so in Jesus' name. And everybody said, Amen, amen. 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 Go ahead and stand. Thank you for that great word from the Lord. But stand and we'll sing the final song. Tis so sweet to trust in Jesus. We can sing that truth, and I pray that we would learn and to love that truth and live that truth out. Tis so sweet to trust in Jesus.
amen. As we are dismissed, hear these words from God in the book of Jeremiah. For I know the plans that I have for you, declares the Lord. Plans for welfare and not for calamity, to give you a future and a hope. Then you will call upon me and come and pray to me, and I will listen to you. You will seek me and find me when you search for me with all your heart. May we search for him this week with all our hearts. Amen. You are dismissed. Have a great day.